Hello and welcome everyone officially to this Kindred Community Talk event. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm thrilled to see your names and faces and knowing that we're bringing people together from all over for this. And I can't wait to introduce you to our guest today. I've been connected with him for quite a while and have been really looking forward to hearing from him directly. We've been in communication less directly, so I'm excited to learn more about his work and be able to share that with you, especially knowing that he is out in Singapore. So what to expect for Kindred Community Talks? It's a chat with our featured guests for about 30 minutes, including their backstory and strategies for maintaining energy and passion for their work and any current projects they wanna share about. You may use the chat to submit questions. I'll try to keep an eye on it, although I tend to get pretty engrossed in the conversation, I will forewarn you. And then we'll have our 15 minute after party so that you can talk directly to us and unmute yourself if you'd like and ask questions. I want to introduce our guest to you. So today we have Harish Nim, who is an engineer, an MBA, a quantum health coach and end of life doula, who is currently pursuing his doctorate and PhD in integrative medicine. He was born and educated in India, relocated to Singapore in 1992, and then started a technology company that grew into a 2,400 employee company across 11 countries. In 2019, Harish retired to pursue his passion for integrative medicine. His other passions include angel investing, spirituality, and golf. Harish is the founder, owner, director of several private limited companies in Singapore. He has been honored in several forums for his entrepreneurship, including the Singapore government's Spirit of Enterprise Award in 2004, the ASME's Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2005, and the SICCI Indian Entrepreneur Award for Large Enterprises in 2009. Harish passionately supports causes that benefit women and children's education, health and well being, as well as those that help blind people. In 2020, he started Somatosoul, a not for profit center in Singapore for mind, body, spirit, and art. So, welcome, Harish. Thank you, Francesca. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank and, you so uh, much for joining us and accepting my invitation. Absolutely. And, so I'm going to uh, dive right in and ask a question that will get to the heart of how you bring your compassion into the world. So can you share a story of loss or change that taught you something profound and led you to where you are today? So about, uh, about 30 years ago, I lost my father. Um, I lost my father and uh, I had uh, a mother and three younger sisters that I decided to take responsibility for financially, emotionally. And I was working in India at that time. And I figured that with a family of my own, that I would need to earn more money. Uh, so that was what got me to move to Singapore. Um, So that was a life-changing event for me. I have an elder brother and elder sister, but uh, I decided to take on the responsibility for my family. And then in, in May this year, I lost my mom. So she survived for 30 years. And Francesca, I, I can't tell you how much the end of life doula course helped me with my mom. Thank you. Uh, she had dementia and she was living with me 
and for 10 years i saw her dementia progress and uh, you know there were things like uh, i think about five years ago she forgot who i was uh, but every day i would come home by 7 30 i would sit with her and the few days i couldn't the helpers knew that my mom was missing something so she didn't remember she didn't recognize me uh, as a son but uh, But she sensed my presence. So we would sit together and we would just listen to spiritual songs together. And uh, then about two years ago, she started not looking at me or anyone, but she would look over my shoulder. And then because of my, my studies with you, I would ask her, so, Mom, how many people are there? And she would tell me. And I would say, these are all, all these people love you. So it was just, it's amazing to see her progress. And I was with her when she died. It was, it was, you know, and the thing is that she's been living with me. I got her over to Singapore 20 years ago. She's been living with me and uh, I didn't realize how much I would miss her. There was a, there was a big void, which I couldn't understand where it's coming from, but But that made me even more passionate about working with people at the end of life. And because of what I had learned, I just let her be the way she wanted to be, you know? I mean, there's no... I mean, how can I say how, how she should die she, or how she should live the last few years of her life she will I just have to be there and support her in terms of physical needs in terms of uh, emotional needs just, just be there I would just sit with her Yeah. Thank you so. so much for sharing those tender memories and moments. And I hope you feel the embrace from this community as you're continuing to grieve this fairly recent loss and, and integrate this shift in your life. I mean, as you said, even 30 years ago, her presence meant so much to you in terms of your life mission and your work and what you sacrificed then and what you prioritized. And clearly that continued the past 30 years and was especially hard work these past couple. I mean, the, the amount of love and open heartedness that, that dementia begs of us is unlike much else. I mean, when we are losing our person incrementally and that role reversal of caring and tending for the people who cared and tended for us when we were young. It's a lot to take on and it's a lot to navigate. And the fact that you were able to continue to find connection throughout that whole journey is just amazing to hear. Yeah, it was, I mean, I'm still grieving, but I'm in no rush to stop grieving, you know. There's no, yeah, I, I miss her. 
I did not think I would. I didn't, I didn't think of it. I didn't miss my, my dad. And yeah, so, so that was my answer to your question. And I appreciate you, you saying that and you allowing yourself to miss her and continue to grieve and not put pressure on yourself to, you know, move on from it or, or pretend that those unexpected feelings aren't continuing to last. And that takes a lot of courage, but as we all know, that that really is the pathway to healing and to continuing to honor the relationship that will never end because for you it's always going to be there in a part of your life yes thank you thank you so in terms of tough times and the work you do with somatosol especially can you share your top two or three strategies for supporting people through their times of intensity You know, um, what I find works really well with people is to be absolutely present. And not be judgmental, not be... Uh, all knowing and you know so so i so i can figure out that it's wrong thinking or it's a way of thinking that is creating issues in a person's life but i have to do it very gently you know i have to sort of you know try and get them to change the way they think without saying it like that so um, because as part of my my studies uh, think thoughts create emotions emotions create blockages in the in the body and It's uh, it's not surprising there are so many people out there who need support, who need help. I just put out this small, small video uh, on self-help. So Samatha Soul, my idea was we just uh, give people tools to... Um, help in their journey and to help them live better. So I put out this little video, very short video uh, on Instagram um, on Jinshin Jutsu. It's an ancient Japanese modality uh, which has to do with how you can balance your emotions for yourself. And that has a million and a half views and, you know, people saying, how can we learn more? So now I'm doing videos on teaching people each of the little things that they can do on their own. Because, you know, uh, fortunately, I don't need the money. So I'm doing this to give tools um, to people, which will help them live better. So, so some of the soul is, uh, I'm, I'm very happy I did it. I started it uh, in, in February of 2020, and then the pandemic happened. And, but we kept it on and, you know, we've, one of the things that I discovered in Singapore was that we have a lot of uh, domestic workers from Philippines, India, Myanmar, uh, and suddenly everyone is home. 
you know, the 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 the, the master of the house, the, the madame of the house, the children, right? They're all at home and and the domestic workers can't go back home to uh, be with their children, with their parents, with their family. So we started a program on Sunday, a free program, you know, to help them with chiropractic, with yoga, with meditation, mindfulness, and certain breath and movement so that, you know, they could de-stress and they could continue. And so that was, that was nice. So some of the soul is about giving back to society, giving back to people, to our fellow human beings. Thank you for being of service in that way. I'm wondering, as you know, a lot of people in this audience are death care workers and doulas specifically. Is there a, a tool that you can share with us or a, an approach or a strategy that either through Somata Soul or your own personal experiences caring for your mother, something at a very basic level that we could incorporate into our work and either preparing ourselves for our work or in releasing and cleansing after our work? So here I would like to, so why I start, why I was interested in working with dying people was because of uh, my, I adopted a guru. Uh, he was a guy called Dr. Richard Alpert, who was a Harvard professor of psychology, I don't know, someone called, and then he was later known as Ram Das. So he said, and I embody that, that something like in working with those who are dying, I offer another human being a spacious environment with my mind in which they can die as they need to die. I have no right to define how people should die. I'm just to help them in the transition, however, however they need to do it. So it's, uh, it's difficult uh, because of the beliefs and the, the fear that people have about dying um, and you know it's not it's not at all appropriate to tell them what Emmanuel says about dying it's like no not appropriate but he said so Ramdas asked Emmanuel, Emmanuel is an entity, what should I tell people about dying? And Emmanuel said, tell them it's absolutely safe. It's like taking off a tight shoe. So, but that is not something that you can tell someone who dying but it's it's nice for me to believe that and to approach it from that angle and just support the person whatever the person wants to uh, whatever their beliefs are whatever they want to which is fine because everyone will will transition as they need to because there are learnings in that too um, but just 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 be there as another 
another soul, another human being who's just there. He's got no agenda. Yeah, people will often be able to find their sources of comfort if they're held in that sort of environment where they're encouraged and invited to explore what that might mean for them. So becoming the person who will sit next to them and say, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't have your answers, but I'm here yeah. to listen and learn and make sure you don't feel alone in this. And it is always an interesting situation when we feel like we have information that could be beneficial for someone to hear, but we're not exactly sure if it's going to be 100% applicable. And, and how do you thread that needle and finding that balance of, you know, perhaps you would be able to say that quote from Emmanuel, but in a way of saying, you know, someone once said and say that, you know, how does that sound to you? And you could offer it up as a kind of a conversation starter and a place to continue to hear, you know, that resonates or that doesn't. And then those of us who have perhaps witnessed dying, we have a frame of reference as well that can provide some comfort to people when, you know, many of us have seen those who are nearing the end and their final breaths really do tend to find peace, even if leading up to that, there could have been some agitation or some anxiety. You know, often it's not uncommon for people to really slip into a more peaceful state as they are getting very close to death and that moment. And, and that can bring some comfort to people as well, because, you know, culturally, we've outsourced so much of it and we're just not witnessing the process as much as we used to. And so we don't know what to think and it's the unknown that can bring so much fear up in all of us. Yeah, which is uh, absolutely right. And uh, uh, there was no way my mother would, would, would transition in a, in a, in a hospital or in a hospice, you know, she would and uh, I, you know, so I believe in just just being available uh, in case someone wants, you know, comes up for air and, and needs something. Otherwise, I'm just there. You know? What do you want me to do? How can I help? What do you need? Yeah, that continuous availability and presence can bring a lot of relief to someone who is in their process of dying and then those around them as well. That's steady, steadiness. Yeah. So I'm curious if you're willing to let me shift gears a little bit, because I know within the doula community, especially, there are quite a few people who are hoping to launch a private practice or maybe expand a private practice. And you come from an entrepreneurial background and you've found a lot of success as an entrepreneur. And I'm wondering, I, I didn't ask you this in advance, so I'm just throwing this at you, but if you have any basic tips that you could share for someone who's getting started, who's maybe not naturally inclined to running a business, but who recognizes that that's necessary as part of a private practice. So there are a few basics. Uh, um, you know, an entrepreneur to be successful always delivers more than the promise. Um, so you. Obviously, all all the all the doulas here are 
providing a service that is very needed and uh, essential. And it's, it's actually such a beautiful profession or thing to do. And we just, we just do what we do and this kind of a service business grows by reference. And, you know, just to, just to share with you, I mean, I had a different business. And I started with $12,000. And by the time I retired, I had generated a billion dollars in revenue. A billion dollars in revenue from $12,000. Because I just went the extra mile. It was not about making money. So it was about, about providing a service which people would value. People would see that, yes, it's, it's different. It's like from the heart. It's even though it's IT services, you know, even though it's IT or anything, you know, service is service. Um, so what I, what I used to tell people was that, you know, whether you are selling to an IBM or an HP or an Apple, you're not selling to the organization. You're selling to the individual. And there needs to be a connection that individual needs to trust you, especially if it's a service. Um, you know, the person needs to trust you. The, the buyer needs to trust you because he will only know what you've delivered once you've delivered, whether you can. So that, that trust uh, needs to come in. And I'll share another story about, uh, you know, so I decided to sell my business. So there's this Japanese uh, telecom company that, that bought my, my, my business. And the CEO asked me, so Nimsan, we are a Japanese company. We have only Japanese employees. We all think the same. How can you manage 21 different nationalities? I hadn't even thought about it. And I just looked at him and I said, I don't care about nationalities. They're human beings. And all human beings have the same, same desires you know, to be respected at work, to earn a good living, to progress in life. So at the base of it, we may be Japanese, Malaysian, Singaporean, Indian, Chinese, Filipina, German, but we are all the same. We are, we are all human beings. And I think that's what clinched the sale for me. But, you know, it was like human beings. So in terms of, in terms of entrepreneurship, it's actually very simple. You don't need a fancy website. You, don't need anything. you just need to do good work just need to put your heart into it, which I know this community does, otherwise they would not be doing this. So it's very easy for everyone here to do what, what they're destined to do and to make a good living out of it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that insight. And I think something that new doulas or new entrepreneurs lose sight of is that it takes a little bit of time to start to build momentum 
and to build your reputation and to just find some patience in that process. Because I know for me with the educational opportunities that I have discovered for myself, the networking, just sharing about what I do, teaching about it locally, that is what has enabled me to become a, 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 a place, a person that doctors especially will refer their patients to. And now I, I have people who reach out to me and say, hey, I've got this patient or hey, I've got this client. I think they could benefit from your offerings. Can I connect you? And that happens really naturally. And then the momentum builds because more people know about you and then they share it with their friends or with their patients and clients. And then it starts to kind of pick up steam and take on its, its own energy. But to get to that point, you know, it takes a little bit of time. And, and like you were saying, trust building, you know, it takes that rapport building, that trust building one-on-one -on -one and within you and your community, within you working well and complementing in a complementary sense with, with hospice, with palliative care, so that they know that we can all work in harmony together. So that that's really a part of building your, whether it's a business, you know, whether it's private practice and that you're charging for your services, whether it's volunteer and you're just trying to get your name out to the community as a go-to person, no matter your goal, that that's a part of it. That's a part of the building. And it can be a really beautiful part of the evolution. Just you're so, so right. Which is why I mentioned that I started with just a mere $12,000. You know, it, of course it took time. You know, it, it, took, it took 18 years to get a billion dollars out of it. But, you know, it just, you just, Stay with it because you're doing what you're passionate about. And that passion shows. You know? Um, yeah. My other advantage was I had beautiful, beautiful people with me. So my clients would say, hey, you know, all the other service providers that we have, we keep seeing new faces from those companies. But in your company for the last 15 years, we've been seeing the same faces. So again, you know, I mean, it's like, hey, yeah, isn't that how it's supposed to be? Without saying lifelong employment or whatever, but you know, it's what human beings, you just, just treat them like human beings. You treat them well, you treat people well. Everyone, you know, whether it's a checkout lady at, at the supermarket, it's, you just, you just do your bit to make people happy. Yes, and the world certainly needs that right now. It feels like more than ever. So thank you for that message. And thank you for sharing everything about your your personal background, about your business background, about your passion projects and sharing your heart and wisdom with us. I so appreciate you being a part of this and I, I thank you, Harish. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop the recording so we can have our after party, but until next time, everybody, and I will be announcing our next guest soon. Take care.